Hello everyone, my name is Caroline Jackman and I head up the business skills work for the Crafts Council and I am delighted to welcome Briffa Legal here today to talk about how to protect the design and copyright of your craft business. Before I hand over to my guest Alex, I would just like to say a few things. This webinar is being recorded and we will be sharing this on our website afterwards and with our delegates. Also, if you have any questions, please do use the Q&A function available at the bottom of your screen. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the context of why we think you should consider design and copyright of your craft business in relation to the, the whole of your business. First of all, looking at the rationale. Do you need to protect your business? This is a question for you to think about. Now, protecting your business can mean many things. It can mean protecting your ideas, your designs, but also thinking about the whole infrastructure of protecting your business. Do you have various paperwork in place that looks at legal agreements, if you're licensing work, those sorts of things. So think about the breadth of what protect means. Another thing to think about is monetizing your ideas. And that is particularly in relationship to licensing or collaborations with other brands. You might have ideas or concepts that you could monetize with another brand. And that is something that could definitely grow your business potential. Research. What are the options open to you? And we will be hearing from Alex from Briffa Legal very soon, who will be talking through the various options. But what can you put in place yourself? And also thinking about the support available. So there'll be um, the legal framework that the likes of Briffa Legal can offer, but there are other organisations such as ACID, which is anti-copying in design, an, an organisation that supports people with the copyright and design rights of their businesses. But also think about the things that you can do yourself. What sort of things can you have, the paperwork that you need in place? Think about these things. Speak to your peers, speak to legal professionals. Planning, always good to have a plan. And the best place to start is a business audit. Think about what you already have in place, the skills that you have, the skills available to you through your networks, and also the skills even broader than that that could be available through other organizations such as the Grass Council. What do you have already in place? Also worth revisiting your business plan. What is the plan ahead for the next six months and further down the line to think about how to protect your business and looking for future opportunities to monetize your ideas? Then secondly, to think about investment. Obviously, researching will definitely help with identifying the associated costs. And also a business plan. So you can really look to now and in the future, shorter and longer term aims to help shape an investment plan. And in thinking about other ways that you can grow your business initially to reinvest into protecting these bigger ideas, bigger concepts. Finally, connections definitely worth seeking legal advice from the professionals. Also worth speaking to your peers who have already done various steps to protect their business, whether through trademarks, design rights, as well as copyright concerns. And always worth speaking to the wider network. It's definitely really important to grow those connections and think about, again, the rationale, what steps you need to take to protect your business. 
Okay, so that's a little bit from me to sort of setting the context of why thinking about design and copyright of your craft business is a good idea. Now, I'm going to hand over to Alex Wellen from Briffa Legal, who will be sharing a very expansive talk and presentation um, of all things linked to protecting your business. So Alex, I'm going to hand over to you to share your screen and continue the talk. Thank you, Thank you Alex. Cheers, Carolyn. Appreciate that very much. Um, hi, everyone. I um, hope everyone is well. So as Karen said, my name is Alex. I'm a solicitor here at Briffa. Um, we deal with uh, a breadth of intellectual property matters and commercial matters here. So I'm hoping that today we can go through some of the core fundamental basics uh, of intellectual property. Um, we'll certainly be covering trademarks and designs and copyright. Um, and depending on how much time we've got, we might cover some commercial matters towards the end. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here and hopefully everyone can see. I think that'll be yes. <laughs> um, so, as I mentioned, these are what we're going to be concentrating on today. So the core fundamental basics of IP that all startup businesses should really be considering uh, at its inception. We see a lot of the time businesses are very eager to you know, get, have an idea and they want to get the product to market as quickly as possible. Um, and, and IP is one of those things that tends to be left to the wayside and forgotten about or they don't really want to spend too much money on it. And hopefully I will explain today why that's not really the correct thought process to have um, and why IP can be so fundamentally important to your business. So we'll begin with uh, we'll begin with trademarks. Um, so well, first and foremost, what is a trademark? I mean, quite simply, uh, a trademark is a recognizable symbol or sign or design um, or expression that identifies products or services from a particular uh, particular source and distinguishes them from others. Now there are different things that you can trademark. Um, some examples on the screen here. I can include logos, shapes and colors, uh, slogans, words, stylized words, uh, and even music or, or the, the jingles. If you think about um, products or, or brands like Dell, um, they've got a really recognizable uh, jingle that goes with their adverts. Um, Audi, those, those sort of um, notes they have at the end, and even as, as on the screen here, McDonald's, the, the I'm loving it whistle. Uh, so these have all become synonymous with these brands and, and, and help people identify and recognize and associate them with that brand. So when you're looking to register then, what is it exactly that you need to be, to be looking at and what you need to be looking to do? Well, I mean, the obvious first one is you need to set on a brand. Um, and there are two key principles when coming up with a brand. It, it can't be generic. It, it, it needs to be distinctive and it can't describe the goods or services that you're providing. Now, there are ways in which you can get around it, but unless you impose a super aggressive, very expensive marketing strategy, then you, it's just not going to be possible. The two good examples that I can provide are Compare the Market, um, who had their very aggressive meerkat marketing campaign, um, which eventually got them over the hurdle of a trademark that was basically describing what they did, comparing the market. Uh, and the other one, which I'm sure we've still got the jingle ringing through our heads, is we buy any car. Doc. Oh. So, <laughs> so you can see why that that, that 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 marketing strategy that those two companies imposed it garnered them such a reputation that whenever we say compare the market or we buy any car. They're no longer just generic terms anymore. They are automatically associated with that brand. When you have come up with your brand name and you're happy that it's, it's, it's distinctive and it's clever and it, it doesn't describe your products, uh, the next thing to do is to actually find out whether or not somebody's already had the same idea. And there are two considerations for this. Um, the first one is, is, is fairly obvious. You can go onto the IPO website and you can search the UK register and start typing in your brand name and just seeing what, what comes up. Is, is that name already a registered name? 
Uh, and if it is, is it registered for the same goods and class, the same goods and services that, that you're, you're looking to provide? Because um, if it's not, then you should still be okay to proceed with your application. The, the one that a lot of people miss is looking at trademarks that are not registered, so unregistered trademarks. Because um, not everybody will apply for a, for a, for a trademark. Um, and, and this is where just, just search engines, Google searches, can be very helpful because if you you can you can type in your brand name in there and, and see what pops up. Now the only thing I would say on that is, as we all know, with, with Google results, it throws out tens, if not hundreds, if not millions of results that come out to you. Um, you are only interested in brands that are in the territory. So in this case, the UK. Uh, if there's another company in America and they've got the same brand name as you. So long as they're not trading in the UK, then you do not need to worry about them. So when you do these Google searches and just trying to make sure that there is nobody else out there in the UK that has an unregistered mark, you're only, you're only concentrating on, on UK companies or companies that are actually trading in the UK. The reason why I, I mention this is because if you do decide to, you're, you're going to apply for your trademark and you're successful um, and somebody else a few years down the line comes along and they then want to register their trademark, you may you will almost certainly be notified by the IPO. So oh, there's a there's another trademark that has been applied for and it's very similar to yours. You may decide you want to do something about that. If it transpires that this other mark, this later mark, is is it's got what we call pre-existing rights. So because they were around before you, they could apply to have your mark invalidated or revoked. Um, on the grounds that they have been trading longer than you and they're relying on their pre-existing rights. Now, I'll go on to a, a, little, a little bit later on as to where that burden of proof lies and, and, why, and, and why it's such an advantage to have a registered mark. Um, but we'll, we'll come on to that in just a minute. The very last thing to consider is whether you want to register a word mark or if you want to register uh, a logo. So to give a really easy example, McDonald's name or the golden the golden arches. There, they are, there, there is a distinction between the two, and it's not just that one's a word and that one's a logo. You are word marks, word marks are far more broad in their protection. If you can get if you can get a word mark, it's it's, it's recommended that you try and go for it. Uh, and it's purely because of the broad protection that it, that it provides. If you if you have a word mark. Or um, uh, uh, compare that to a, a logo or a figurative mark that has the word in it. When you're looking to compare potentially infringing marks, if you've got another figurative mark that's out there and it's got that word in, you don't need to worry about it. You've got that word mark, that word is protected. If you've only got a figurative mark and they've got a figurative mark and the word is not identical but it's sort of similar, there is going to be, you're not necessarily just comparing the word you are also comparing what else is distinctive within that logo. So it just leaves the, the, a little gap in the door, a little crack in the door um, to, to start picking at distinctions between the two marks. Now, off the back of that, everyone's going to be like, right, well, I'm definitely going to want to go for a, for a word mark, of course. Um, and, and, I, and I wouldn't blame you, of course, naturally. To obtain a word mark, there's a much higher standard um, applied by the IPO. Um, it, it is much more difficult to obtain, particularly if you have got a mark that is sort of on the cusp of maybe being descriptive or potentially not very distinctive. Um, they will they will apply a higher burden for word marks. However, if you if you flip that and say I'm going to go for a, a logo instead, then more often than not, you, you're going to be okay, providing that there's no one else out there to, to, to block your path. So once we are, we, we, we've got our brand, uh, we're happy that it is, it is uh, unique and it's not descriptive, and there's, there's no one else that's got it, and we, we want to go for a word mark, we need to consider what classes we, we want to protect our brand in. Now, Sometimes we will get people that come to us and say, oh, I, I want to protect it in, in everything, in all 45 classes. Um, and that's just simply not, it's just simply not feasible. Um, you're, in the UK and in fact around the world, 
pretty much every single product or goods and services, they're all divided into four to five classes. So products, as you can see on the screen, are divided into classes one to 35. Uh, services are between 36 and 45. You really just want to be sticking to the classes that are relevant to your trademark. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First one is the expense. Uh, it does cost more money, more classes that you have. But secondly, if you start registering your trademark in obscure classes that you've really got no intention of actually using so for example if you are a figurine company and then you decide to register your trademark in class 25 for clothing but you've got no intention to go into clothing at all somebody can very easily apply to just have that element of your trademark removed and just have it removed from your overall registration and ultimately all you will have achieved is just spending money on something that you just didn't need to do so it is important to consider the classes that are relevant to you and, and not just necessarily in the immediate in, in in the immediate when you're registering right here and then have a think about in five years time what could you be expanding into what are you likely to be doing in those first five years and the reason why that's important is because when you when you are when you register when you obtain a registered trademark you're given a five-year grace period you don't have to use it immediately you are given a five-year grace period to get the business up and running and to start trading and to start using it what that means is is that you don't necessarily have to be using your trademark in all of the classes that you've registered it into you could for example launch with a few products just to get you started and then two three years later go into in your, in your expansion plan go into another area which you've already got protected in your, in your trademark and then another year later on move into something else but it's okay because it's all within your registered trademark now it is it is possible um to apply for additional classes in the future however funds if funds are, are available in the beginning we would always advise that you seek to register the classes all the classes that you would like at the beginning and, and it simply comes down to cost it's just it, it's far cheaper uh overall in the long run it is cheaper to obtain so to, to make one application with all the classes that you want compared to making one application for say two classes and then three years later another application for two more classes because what the ipo doesn't allow you to do is once you've got a trademark is to just tack on classes in the future it requires a brand new application hence the additional fees every single time so when we when we're looking at uh, a lot of the people a lot of the members that are our webinar today um i put together what i believe would be probably the most popular classes um, amongst the group so class two paints for arts and craft nine magnets 14 jewelry uh, 16 craft paper 20 figurines 21 ceramics uh, 24 fabrics 25 clothing 26 embroidery uh, 28 model kits uh, christmas tree ornaments as we're heading into the christmas period um, class 35 is pretty much for everyone sort of retail services and wholesale services uh, 40 things like embroidery services uh, customized services and 42 design services now obviously this is not an exhaustive list um what, what we'll suggest is is you when you speak with a solicitor on a one-to-one -one basis then you know, we will go through that with you what what the goods and services are that you are providing and obviously narrow it down and make sure that you know all the classes that are going are going there for you are relevant to 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 you so let's discuss a little bit about why trademarks are, are, are important what's the point of them well, the, the biggest thing is that they, gen they generate a monopoly over your chosen brand within the territory that you're registered in. So once you have that trademark, if you've got that trademark registered in class 25, nobody else can use that mark in class 25 for the goods that you are providing. So it's a very powerful tool. And if you think about companies in general and brands that you know, all of the goodwill and all of the good reputation, or in some cases, bad reputation, it all stems from the brand. That is what is associated with people and, 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 and companies. So uh, having a brand that is registered and becomes well-known is, is a very powerful thing. 
it further allows you to check the conflicting marks. And what we mean by that is, and I don't mean going off and doing searches yourself, is once you have a registered trademark, if anyone else applies in the UK for a mark that is similar to yours, the IPO will be in touch with either yourself directly or your IP representative to inform them that there's someone trying to apply for a mark that they believe is fairly similar and we may decide or you may decide that you want to do something about it. In other words, you may wish to oppose that application. Trademarks as well, they act as a commercial asset for your business and particularly because they last forever and subject to renewing every 10 years and, and then not becoming generic. Uh, such as the brand Hoover, for example, because we will we all call vacuum cleaners Hoovers, um, but they 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 last forever, and you can license them. You can use them to generate income for your business. If you've got a product and you want to franchise that out, or if you want other businesses to be able to sell that product and then have that brand associate your brand associated with them, license these license these trademarks. You know, get. You, this second stream of income for the business. Very, very useful. Trademarks also, as I touched upon before, they protect, they protect your brand names. And this is what I was allu alluding to earlier about the burden of proof when you're uh, with an infringement claim going on. When you have a registered trademark, the onus is on the other party to show that their mark is either not infringing or that your mark is infringing. There's no requirement for you to prove otherwise, and there's no requirement for you to prove any kind of copying at all. If, so in other words, if someone else is using your trademark, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if they've not seen your trademark at all, yours is registered, and that's basically the be all and end all of it. You don't need to prove that they've copied it at all. It signifies its origin. If you think about brands like Adidas and Nike and Converse, as we've got up on here, everybody knows these huge brands. They know the history of these brands, where they've come from. Um, and and it, it all comes down to the, the, the sort of story of that business and, and, and how it's grown and blown up and expanded. And I mean, these all, all of those businesses started very, very, very small, and they grew into huge global, global companies that they are today. But the point being that the, it's the brand that signifies where they all originated from, where all these products originate from. And lastly, most people here, I suspect, will be only really keen on looking at the UK market in terms of registering in UK um, trademarks. But once you've got a trademark, you can use that to apply elsewhere. Uh, we have what's called the Worldwide Intellectual Property Office or WIPO or, or WIPO. Um, once you have a registered trademark, you can use that mark to piggyback other applicate wiper applications into other jurisdictions. So if you were looking to expand into the EU now, now that the UK is, is no longer a part of the EU, if you wanted to trade in the EU, you would need to obtain a separate uh, trademark in the EU to ensure that your brand is protected there. Same likewise for America or China, India, wherever, each country each country you want to go into would require a new trademark within that territory. And of course, that means that there'll be additional searches would be required to make sure there's nobody else within that territory that's already using, already using that mark. So that's that that's sort of the fundamental basics on, on, on trademarks. Um, we'll, we'll move on to sort of designs. And, and as you can see from the sign here, there, there are two types to consider, both registered and, un and unregistered. Um, we'll, we'll take a look at registered designs first, um, and uh, our, our good friends over at Rockus who provided us with this, uh, this image of their lovely fruit bowl that's, that's been registered, thought it was a really uh, fitting image to pop in here. Uh, but we'll talk a bit about, you know, what, what is a registered design? And, and similarly to, to trademarks, I mean, a registered design is, it is a monopoly. It's a monopoly right uh, for the appearance of the whole or, or part of a product resulting from uh, the features of, in particular, lines, contours, shape, texture, materials um, of the product or its ornamentation. In other words, it's the design, the design of the product. The two key things for when you're considering registering design is that it has to be new. You can't look to apply for a registered design for a product that already exists, and it must have some kind of individual character. So, for example, if you have designed a table, you 
unless it's got something unique about it, you're not going to be able to just simply register a, a, a bog standard four legged table. Why bother with with uh, with registered designs? So, see, as I said, as I said from the previous slide, it secures your protection in shape and configuration, whether that be a two D shape or a three D shape. And it provides you with an exclusive right. And much like with the trademarks, and as it says down the bottom there, once you have that registered design, there is no need to prove any kind of copying. If somebody is out there and they're selling a product, a counterfeit, or, or something that looks really highly similar uh, to, to your design, you do not need to show or demonstrate that they had the opportunity to copy your product. The very fact that you've got that registered design is, 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 is that's the only hurdle you need to cross is, I believe that that product is similar or the same as my product and I've got a registered design, therefore that is infringing. Unlike trademarks, they don't last forever. Uh, registered designs last 25 years, subject to being renewed every five years. Um, and this really key thing here is 12 month grace period. So with designs, if you have, if you've published your design in public, you, you basically start a clock running, a 12 month clock running before you would need to apply for it to be registered. If you have sold your product or released it to the, to the public, or if you, you put up on social media um, and you don't seek that registered design within a year, you, 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 you essentially you, you, you will not be able to use the protections afforded by having a registered design. You will still almost certainly be able to get a registered design certificate, but if anybody was to do it, just try and enforce that right, and it'll be found out that you had already published it more than 12 months from the date of your registered certificate, they would be able to apply to invalidate your certificate. It would, it would be pretty powerless. The other thing you need to be careful as well in those situations, if you do decide, okay, I released it over a year ago, if I want, I want to get the registered design anyway. Um, you need to be careful when you look to try and enforce it is that you don't fall foul of uh, malicious infringement claims. They can, they, it, can, it can be a helpful tactic, particularly against smaller designers who don't necessarily have the means to pay for solicitors to, to check whether or not you know, the, the, the certificate is valid or not. A lot of the times, a lot smaller Businesses, sole traders, boys, if they get a claim to say, oh, look, you, you're copying me, I've got registered design, a lot of the time we see that they will just say, right, okay, fine, we're going to stop and we'll drop it. Bigger companies, on the other hand, will hire a solicitor and it shouldn't take too long to find out, you know, that it was available more than a year and then they can just threat to have it invalidated. So just to do pay attention to any of you who have already published your, your designs or sold designs, uh, that clock is already ticking. Uh, and I would recommend that you sort of speak to myself or one of my colleagues about whether or not you, you should consider getting that design registered. So on the flip side then, we'll look at unregistered designs. So um, similarly to, unregistered designs are very similar to copyright, which we'll, we'll, we'll touch upon soon, um, in that it arises from the act of, of, of creating the design. Um, it, it's an automatic, it's an automatic right. Um, you don't need to do anything just by creating the, the, uh, an object. You will have an unregistered, you have an unregistered design. Much like uh, registered designs, uh, it will protect the shape uh, and configuration um, of three D objects against copying by others. So it's a lot, it's a lot more restricted. Unregistered rights uh, in the three D shape and configuration will include both with internal configurations and external configurations. So for example, the product that I've got up here, it's not just the shape of the flask, but also uh, the, 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 the base and, and, and the sphere ball at the top as well, that all of that would, in, would be included. Um, unregistered designs, so unlike registered designs, which can last 25 years, unregistered designs will either last 10, 10 years from the date of first sale or 15 years from when it was first created. Uh, and and which one it goes by is just whichever one ends first. The other thing you need to consider with unregistered designs as well is that within its final five years of protection, um, you must allow others to use the design. And it's called a license of right. Uh, and unfortunately, you can't get paid for, for that license. 
Um, it can't be unreasonably withheld, um, but the other people do need to ask your permission. So they can't just automatically just start pr producing uh, copies. They do need to come to you and seek permission in those final five years. One thing it doesn't protect is things like surface decoration or anything that's been copied or commonplace. Um, it doesn't protect method of construction or the principle of construction much. That's more sort of patent side of things, which we're, we're not, we're not going to touch upon today. Lastly, so there's uh, something that's sort of more unique to the UK. Uh, the UK introduced in 2021 was called a supplementary unregistered design right. Um, is a three-year term for them, which begins from the date the design was made public, either in the UK or in the EU. These do cover not just 3D shapes, but also 2D shapes. And there were things like said shapes, decoration, color texture, materials, and ornamentation. So, for example, uh, on the on the on the glass that I've uh, picture image I popped on here, uh, those rings all that you can see being spiraled around the sphere, those. Those textures, those materials, and the colors that are all there would all be all form part of this supplementary unregistered design. But as you can see, it's very limited in terms of that, 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 that three, three years compared to registering that as a design, as a design where you'd have a 25 year protection on it. Uh, but just very, very quickly touch upon uh, the EU. So we do have uh, design, design rights, um, both unregistered and registered in the EU. Um, similarly, if you make a design public in the EU, uh, it's protected in the EU for three years from the date that it was made public. So unlike the UK, where you can get 10 or 15 years, it's three years in the EU. Um, it's called an unregistered community design right. Um, however, there is no protection outside of the EU. Um, and that includes the UK, unfortunately, because of, because of Brexit and the UK not being a part of the EU anymore. So just conclude with some key differences then between registered and unregistered. So unregistered rights are free to own. Registered rights provide much longer term of protection. Unregistered rights, you still need to prove that copying took place. So you not only, you not only need to demonstrate that the other person has copied your product, you also need to demonstrate and be able to prove that they had the opportunity to, to copy your product as well. In other words, have they had access to the product or the design? Now, for, for registered cases, we don't need to worry about that. And it wouldn't be difficult because registered design is published on the internet. For unregistered design, that's very hard to show if you, if you can have any sort of evidence that says, yes, they, they've had it or they've, they've, I've got something that can prove that they had access to it. Registered designs are obviously certified. Um, unregistered, you've got limited jurisdiction in terms of its restrictions in, in the UK and the EU. Um, and registered designs, more than anything else, they are they are they provide a, a lot of protection considering how cheap they are to obtain. To apply for a registered design in the UK for a one design, I think it's about fifty pounds um, as your official fees. And I think if you want to go more than one design, I think the next tier is up to ten designs, which is about seventy pounds. So it's really is cheap as chips to get registered designs. Um, you can have something like up to up to 12 drawings per design. Um, although we would advise you only have seven. So if you wanted to go to the EU as well, they only permit a maximum of seven. So it's you know, things like that to consider. Um, but yeah, I mean, we would really would recommend if you've got a, if you've got a product um, uh, and, it, and it's it, it's doing well. Um, we would strongly suggest that you consider registering it as a, as a design to get that, to get that protection. I'm, I'm going to finish up on, on these very well, very quickly, but just to say as well, so with, with designs, registered designs, what, what you are, are protecting is the actual product. So if, in other words, if you were to hold a mirror up to it, it, you know, it's a copy of itself. That is what you are protecting. You would not be protecting uh, for example, if um, um, if somebody came up with uh, with a design for a um, for a new a new water bottle, I've got my desk here. Um, the only thing that would be protecting would be that specific design of that water bottle. It wouldn't be protecting all water bottles that came along to the market because then somebody else could come to the market with a different design for a water bottle, for example. That's the sort of key difference between a registered design and a pattern. The pattern will protect the concept, 
the design prep protects the specific product. Uh, so we'll just have, we'll have a look at some examples of some, of some registered trademarks. The shoe here you can see is sort of what we tend to look for when we are applying, when we're making our applications, the sort of drawings we want. CAD drawings are very, very good um, for, 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 for using as design application pictures and, and drawings. Photographs can work, but you want them to be similar to sort of this chair here with sort of very, very little shadowing, plain white background and shows all the detail. Likewise, you're going to want at least four or four to six views. In general, that's front, back, left, right, up and down. Um, you may also then want to go for some diagonal views, or if you've got a product where you know there are things inside that opens up, you might want to go for what's called an, uh, an exploded view, where it sort of breaks it all apart and shows all the inners as well, as well as when it's all, it's all together as, as, it, as it would be sold. Um, so a couple of case studies of, of things that we've, we've dealt with. So this is a company called Trunky, which I'm, I'm sure many of you will have heard that became quite, quite famous and well known uh, after appearing on, on Dragon's Den. So these were these are some of the drawings on the left with the CAD drawings and designs that we registered on, on, on their behalf. Um, so you can get an idea as to the various angles uh, and what you should be sort of looking for. When you're when you're when you're when you're looking to to make your application, and lastly, our our, our good friends um, who 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 rock us, who are members of Craft Council, and uh, allowed us to to use them as an example for this match. This is a a very beautiful uh, wine decanter uh, that they've designed, um, which will, as you can see, not just sit upright but also tilt and and even and even on its side. So. Um, so yeah, it's a very, very nice product, I must admit. It might be a good Christmas present. But uh, yeah, so you can, again, you can see the different angles that they've used here to show uh, sort of front, again, when it's tilting on its side, on its back, et cetera. So key considerations then for registered rights. File early and use the priority period. And by priority period, I mean, when you, when you apply for a registered trademark, you get a trademark and you get it registered, you have a six month priority period in which you can then apply in other jurisdictions. And the benefit of that is if you are su successful in applying for a trademark in the EU, it will backdate your protection in the EU to when you were originally filed in the UK. So take advantage of that whilst you, whilst you can. Consider the value of your inventions and your designs and consider all the applicable goods and services. As I alluded to earlier, it is far cheaper to include all the classes that you want to you want to go into at the very beginning. Although there's more cost up front in the long term, it will it will save you money. Consider all applicable territories and markets. The amount of times that people will say to us, you know, which, which jurisdiction do you want to apply? And they say, oh, we want to register all over the world. It's like, well, okay, you you you, you can theoretically do that. It will, it will cost an absolute fortune and it is completely unnecessary. I mean, there's very, very few brands that are trading in every single country in the world. And to give you a good example, Apple, one of the biggest companies in the world, they are not registered in every single country in the world. So there's absolutely no requirement to do so if, 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 Apple, if Apple don't. Um, and most importantly, have a filing strategy and have a budget in mind as well. When, you, when you're looking at doing your IP and what to protect, think about how much do you want to spend? And we can work, we can work with you on that and prioritize what your immediate needs are within that budget and what can be left until later on as the business grows and expands. And most importantly, don't go it alone. It's very tempting to try and save on solicitors' fees and, and do the applications yourselves. We see it a, a lot. And unfortunately, a lot of the time, these applications, they are either drafted incorrectly or they've not done their checks and they've found they're up against multiple oppositions. Or they didn't have the protection that they thought they were applying for. And ultimately, the end result is they either don't get the trademark that they want or they end up having to spend more money. And that's just not what we want to do. You know, we're here to help and we're here to get it right for you the first time. So we'll, we'll move on to the last topic here then, which is, is copyright. Um, so copyright, similarly to unregistered designs, then it's an automatic right, um, which is, is essentially vested in the author of the works. Um, you cannot have any rights in an idea or a concept. 
So the, uh, for example, the idea of putting a, a photo of, a, of an animal on a jumper, you can't protect that idea. What would be protected would be the specific image of the monkey in this case on, on the jumper. Uh, copyright protects uh, the expression of original ideas. Um, so again, if you think about a good example, I always say it mentioned some clients, when we think about the, the Harry Potter books, for example, the copyright in the Harry Potter books is the, the expression of the story that the, 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 the Harry Potter and, and, and going to Hogwarts and all the story that comes along with that. What's not protected is just the generic idea of a boy wizard who, who lived under the stairs. Anybody could write a book about a boy wizard who had a scar on his head um, and lived under the stairs and then went off to a school. It's, 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 the, it's the actual storyline itself and the words that are being used that expresses that concept and that idea which is protected. Copyright is the right to prevent copying. Now, this again alludes back to what I've mentioned a little bit earlier. Copyright is a tricky one because, because it's an unregistered right. When you are when you are looking to enforce copyright infringement or to allege copyright infringement, there are two key hurdles that you have to apply. The first one is: does the work actually copy your work? So in other words, if you have two paragraphs next to each other, are they the same or wholly or substantially similar, sorry? If there's only a matter of maybe four or five words in a, in a, in a paragraph of 200 words, the chances are we're not going to be able to apply copyright protection to that. Or likewise, if you've got, if you're doing Christmas baubles, for example, and you've got text on the baubles that says, you know, um, Charlie's first Christmas or first Christmas as a husband or a wife or whatever, you know, these are words that have been used over and over and over again for, for many, many years now. They aren't original and you wouldn't be able to claim any copyright in, in those. The second thing is once you're satisfied that there has been you know, the, 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 the words or the, or the expression is identical, then the second hurdle you need to consider is, again, have they had the opportunity to actually copy your product? Copyright does allow two parties to reach the same destination, but via a different path. So if, if two parties can demonstrate their working out and how they got to the same place and it was completely different, you won't be able to bring a copyright infringement claim. They will have reached that same point as you in a completely legitimate way. The other thing when we talk about copyright is, so as I mentioned, it, it, it is automatically does best with the author. And the only exception to that is if, uh, is if you're in an employee-employer situation. So if you have employees out there, anything that they create, the default position in law is that the IP and all of that transfers over to the business, to the employer. Um, you can you can transfer privately between either, either B2B or B2C or C2C. You can transfer copyright, but it has to be done. And if, if, it's not a, if it's not an automatic one like the employer-employee situation, it, it, the only way copyright can be transferred is through an assignment. Um, and that would be a permanent transfer. For temporary transfers, you're looking at licenses. And generally, copyright will last uh, 70 years after the death of the creator. So no matter how many times that, uh, that copyright is assigned over to a new person, the copyright will, will subsist and die where 70 years after the original author passes away. So it can't just keep going on forever and forever. And it's why we've seen, we're now beginning to see original, um, original designs for ca Disney characters, their copyrights are now beginning to expire. So we've already had characters like Winnie the Pooh, uh, Eeyore, um, uh, Cinderella, Snow White, the, all these, these original designs for these characters, uh, their copyright have now passed. Um, there's, uh, I think in the next year, the original, the original expression and drawing for Mickey Mouse, that's due to expire in the next year or two as well. Um, they just do be careful that when we say, you know, the Mickey Mouse copyright is expiring, we are talking about the, the 1920s version of Mickey Mouse, not, not the modern day version, which of course was drawn by somebody else. And that's still copyright protected. So don't, don't fall into, into that trap. 
Um, unlike a lot of the other marks, a lot of the other uh, rights we talked about, copyright is covered worldwide. Um, there are international conventions. Um, it's, uh, it's called the Berne Convention, um, where where it's, 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 uh, it's hundreds of, of countries are signatories to this. And the, the idea behind it was that there was more of a, a global approach to copyright, so there could be standardized rules for everyone around the world. It, it has made life a lot simpler than trying to, to enforce, enforce those rights. Uh, so it's very, very helpful if there's, if there's somebody in America copying something, they can't just hide behind and say, well, we're in America, you're not. Copyright coverages are worldwide. I'm just going to use some examples here of some sort of copyright stuff. So this magazine is designed cover here. Uh, so we've called this the sub is, um, um, and with the, 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 the wallpaper market pattern here. And the monkey one, I do I do want to sort of briefly speak about um, only because it was an interesting story. Some of you may recognize this photo. Um, it was a, it was a British wildlife photographer who was out in, I think, I think he was out in Africa, um, photographing for, uh, the, these, these monkeys. Um, he left his camera set up uh, when, when one of them decided to approach the camera and, and actually he, he, he took a selfie. Uh, and that's the, the resulting photograph is the selfie that the monkey took. The reason why it's of interest is because uh, Peter, the, uh, the, the the organization for um, the, uh, the ethical treatment of animals, uh, they brought a claim against uh, against the photographer. They brought a copyright claim against the photographer on behalf of uh, our friend here, uh, basically claiming that because the monkey had taken the photograph, he owned he technically owned the copyright into it, and thus ensued quite an interesting legal battle about whether or not the animals could own copyright uh, in, in IP and, 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 and how that would work out in, in commercial life. In, in reality, what actually happened was, so in America, it was determined that the, the monkey didn't own the copyright because uh, they've got rules over there that basically say that uh, uh, non-human animals just simply don't have the legal rights to own intellectual property or copyright. So it was settled fairly quickly over there. Um, in England, there was a more interesting debate around joint copyright ownership. Um, so whether or not just, you know, I mean, the argument from the photographer was that he had gone to the country, he had brought all the equipment, set everything up, um, the only thing the monkey did was stand in front of it and press the, 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 the button. Um, but he was the one who essentially instigated the whole thing. Um, in the end, um, there was a settlement that was agreed whereby I think 10% of the, all the royalties this photograph had generated, and it's a lot, 10% <laughs> uh, of all the royalties this photograph generated is now donated to, um, uh, to, the, to, to helping them survive. They were... They were a, 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 an endangered species. Um, so that's, that's, that's all good story, good, good finish in the end. Uh, so we'll look a bit more about... Um... No, sorry, a little... No, sorry. Uh, so we'll look a bit more about what, uh, what copyright... No, no, sorry, I've gone backwards. I mean, I've gone backwards. Let's go forwards. Um, right, management. So this, as I mentioned before, copyright protection, it's free. Um, but there are some considerations. So do consider the author's position. And that alludes back to, is there anyone who could claim joint copyright? Assess your chain of title and provide proof of ownership. And this is really important. Like keep records of your workings out. If you're, if you've got, if you're working on a design, you know, keep all of your workings out from, from its original concept all the way through to its finished product and preferably have them dated. If there is any copyright infringement, you know, action brought or any copyright infringement claim made against you, you can show your working out. That is going to be your, your defense. That evidence will be your defense. Um, and lastly, if you if you're assigning, if you're assigning copyright over um, or letting it go, just, just hold on to them. Um, just, just file them away and keep them safe so we can uh, is there anything, any any arguments over where copyright does subsist? If you've got the assignment agreements all filed away, then there can be no argument they're all signed. So as I said at the bottom there, don't, don't let that be a chink in, the, in your armor. So just some final key considerations then for un unregistered rights. Identify all key stakeholders, founders, shareholders, directors, employees, freelancers, interns, 
suppliers, manufacturers, distrib distributors. Um, think about, particularly with manufacturers, if, they, if you're approaching a manufacturer to produce your product, are they having to change it slightly to fit the manufacturing process? What happens with that, all that, that design alteration? Who's going to own the copyright in that? Ensure that you have contracts with your manufacturers. That means that any alteration, any, any copyright or IP alterations is, is assigned over to, to you and your business. Likewise, if the manufacturer needs to produce unique tools or unique methods in order to manufacture your product, what we call tooling, make sure that the IP in that is transferred across to you. The, the last thing you want to have, be in a situation where is, is if, you, if you fall out with your manufacturer and they own the IP and the copyright in a, in, in a, in a unique manufacturing process or a unique tool that you need to manufacture your goods, you, you're going to be stuck with, with that manufacturer. And if they decide not to do business with you, then it's going to be to the severe detriment of your business. So do, do consider things, do consider these things. Again, free, freelancers, if they're coming in, make sure you have freelancer agreements in place. Make sure that IP is being transferred across. Because they're freelancers and not employees, that IP transfer is not automatic. So it, does, it needs to be put into contracts. Um, clients, B2B, B2C, licenses, users, et cetera. Basically, this is the bottom. Have contracts with everyone. Uh, moving to the last, really last few slides now. Um, so to protect, protect yourself, expect and respond to any trouble. Be proactive and anticipate any infringement and be reactive in responding to infringement. Don't let companies who are infringing on your trademarks or your right registered rights to allow them to get away with it. By doing so, you are almost, you could be deemed to be almost accepting that they're there and that can cause problems down the line if you do then decide you want to do to do something about it. So when we're talking about be proactive, we mentioned searches, Google, Company House, social media platforms, um, websites, IP registers, check all, check all of these things, not just for registered, registered rights, but also for the unregistered trademarks. File your registered rights early. Do them preferably before before you, you've gone to market, before you, you, you started trading, um, get, get, that, get that company name, that brand name registered early, get that design registered before it's, it's, it's launched to the public and it just prevent anyone, anyone from, from nipping in there before you uh, and, and, and causing a whole host of problems. Um, keep records of creative processes for your copyright, make sure they're dated, Keep confidentiality notices. If you've got NDAs in place with people, make sure they're held on to. So again, if there's, if there's something that comes up down the line and you think, hang on a second, I had a meeting with that person, I had a discussion with that person and they signed an NDA and they've got a connection, it's gone out, hold on to it. That's going to be your evidence and it's going to help, help link everything together. And lastly, keep evidence of trade uh, and use of trademarks. So this is this is particularly uh, important if you are already trading and don't have a registered trademark. If you're looking to, to register and there's already a company in place and you want to try and assert your unregistered pre-existing rights, then your evidence is going to be your, your evidence of trade. It's going to be, have, have to be your invoices, your sales. How much reputation have you done? Have you gathered in the territory that you're looking to register in? And that's what you're going to need. And, and feel free. I mean, there's, there's no legal requirement in the UK to use these trademark symbols, uh, but feel free to do so. It tells people that you're, you're switched on. You know, you know what your rights are. Um, and, and you're, you know, it, it can serve as a warning that you know, you're prepared to get these defended. To go through these very quickly, see copyright. If you've got any text and websites, particularly a website, uh, and are any printed materials, put copyright notice, but see copyright notice at the bottom. Everyone knows, you, you, you know what you're talking about. It's copyrighted. You will protect it. Uh, TM, everybody can use the TM symbol, regardless of whether your trademark is registered or not. Um, although preferably you'd only use it if you've got an unregistered trademark. The only one that, uh, that can get you into any sort of trouble in law is if you use the R symbol um, without a registered trademark. The, the R symbol can only be used if you have got a registered trademark. So do just do just keep an eye on that. But so there's, there's no requirement to use these and there's no rules about where it should be placed around your logo. It's purely what you, what you prefer. 
but we would recommend putting them on there. And in terms of being reactive, capture evidence and infringement. As soon as you see it, take screenshots, trade publications, shows, um, photographs. Um, infringing evidence should be dated. So it's, it's, it's really about being organized. As soon as you find infringing evidence, screenshot it, mark it where it was found, date it when it was found, and start, start that, that, that chain of evidence build, to build up. Disclose the infringing mark product works. So you know, go 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 to them and tell them that you know you've got you've got the mark and that they're inf they're infringing it. Um, do you take uh, use takedown procedures or DCMA notices uh, where available? We can escalate to cease and desist letters where necessary. Um, the only thing we would point out is if you've got trademark squatters or domain squatters, so people who are just sat on a trademark or sat on a domain website URL and they're not using it, they're just looking to ransom people who, who would want to use it. Don't engage with them, speak to us to, to, to deal with those professionally. And, and again, as I mentioned before, don't go it alone, speak, speak to a solicitor. When you're looking to protect your IP or if you've been accused of infringing IP, um, seek, seek professional advice. That's what we're, that's what we're here for. Um, final words, as I said, don't wait. Take take legal advice early, and and uh, and and with that, I'll uh, I'll open the floor back to back to Carolyn, and I think I've been talking plenty long enough. Um, and if there's any questions for me, oh Alex, thank you so much, so much information there, and I'm really pleased that we are uh, recording this because I'm sure a lot of people will want to watch this again or listen to this again. Um, we do have um, some questions. So I, I know we're sort of coming to the end of time. So hopefully you don't mind staying on with us for just a, a few of these questions. Um, so we we have one, um, uh, one in regards to using well-known personalities. And I'm, I've taken this question, this has come from Jill, um, mm. in relation to maybe using an icon like David Bowie and um, mm. is this something that people can use a well-known personality in uh, their own original artworks? Uh, sh short answer, it, well, a short answer it depends first and foremost which location or territory we're talking about. So for example, if you are in the UK, then yeah, there's no problem. If it's an original piece of art, then yeah, you can paint a portrait of, of anyone and that will be that will be your art and you can sell it and commercialize it and it's not a problem. Um, you, there may be some issues in um, places like America where image rights are uh, image rights exist in America, um, whereas they don't exist in the UK. So if you are, although you will still, uh, you can still paint it and you can still own it, um, in terms of how you could commercially exploit that in America, there might be a bit more, a bit more trickiness involved in there. Um, but if, 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 if that's the issue, in, in, if you're looking at going into America, I'll, I would need to refer you to some American attorneys, I'm afraid, because it's not my, not my, uh, not my speciality American law. I wouldn't, 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 wouldn't want to try and uh, try and uh, advise on that one. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we have a, a, a question um, in regards to when you're sort of designing a course and um, it's it, it sort of if you sort of designed spent all the time to design a course to teach others and you um, are worried about whether students would take that format and use it mm -hmm. to deliver elsewhere themselves. Yeah. Is there anything somebody can do with about that? Uh, it depends how much they've taken. So the short the short answer is kind of no, because the the the, the, the course itself is you, you think it's more of an idea and concept. What is protected is is how you've gone about expressing that course. So things like your materials that you've used, the words that you've used, uh, if you've done any original images to, to help, you know, help with this course, those are the things that you will have protection in. So somebody could use, go see, go to your course and say, this is a good course, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to do it in a slightly different way. Uh, and then it, it, that, Unfortunately, there's 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 not really anything you could do to to stop them from doing from doing that. 
Um, but yeah, you would need to have a look and pay attention to what what materials are they using? What words are they using? Um, is there is there anything in there at all um, that that could be deemed to have infringed on on any specific elements of, of the copyright that, she, that they, they would they would have? Brilliant, thank you. Um, we've uh, I've got a, an interesting question here from Louise Green in regards to YouTube. Okay. If if you're showing how something is made on YouTube, can you register that? Uh, as 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 in like it's a an original video that they put together. You see, yeah, I think this is quite an interesting one based on what you've been saying because um, the, the registering the mech I don't know whether you can register the mechanism of how you share the information or, or registering how uh, the actual because then it's down to how something is made and therefore the the design, isn't it? Is, is, so if I mean the, 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 the first thing would be is that so that the video that you're putting up on YouTube the, the the IP protection would subsist in copyright so there wouldn't be anything to to register really first and foremost not not really not for a video um, so there's nothing really that you need to do to sort of really further protect anything there um, if if there was. If if if, it, if if there was if, if there was if the product with if the product within the video is something that you have created or designed um, and you're sh and you're, you're putting together a video to show how it works, then in, the, in terms of registrable rights, you'd be looking at registering it as a design. Uh, but that, that would be for the for the product, not not for the video. The video is protected and subsists in, in, in copyright. Um, so there's yeah. nothing really that you you need to do there at all. You you've already got the copyright, so long as it's an you know an original piece of of, of art or or you know, videography in this in this case. Yeah, yeah, okay, uh, yeah. So just to clarify, Louise was referring to the the product. Um, she's just put the product there. So, like you said, um, it's looking at registering the design of that. Yeah. Product. So. In terms of how, so okay, so she's worried about people seeing how it works and, and replicating it then. So yeah, so there, there, there are two there, there are two things here, and it's I, I touched upon it um I, did, I touched upon it a bit earlier. So uh, it, you could register the design, you absolutely. Um, also, it's being it's on YouTube, so it's being published. So that that twelve month clock is already ticking. Um, but in in terms of if, if other people were to see that video and go, oh, okay, I, I think I could build something similar, but it's, it doesn't look the same, then unless she's got a patent, so a patent would, would protect her in terms of how it actually functions, unless she's got a patent, um, then there's, there's, there would be some difficulties about how that could be protected. What I would suggest in order to try and obtain as, as much protection as she can, so if it's being published on YouTube, she, she won't get a patent now. Um, but what, what with, with registered designs, you can you can have one design as the product as it is, as it is sold as one piece, and then you could also register designs for the internal pieces for how it, if, so as long as they're if they're unique to that product and how it works then you could register those as designs as well to try and block people from producing a similar product because if they can't if they can't copy the internals uh to to, to reproduce the product because it's a registered design then that will afford more more protection so that would probably be the, the best way to, to to go to go about it in that case lovely thank you alex and i think that's a similar situation with a, um, a jeweler we've got here, Elsa, who's designed a clasp and a sort of mechanism function for a necklace. So it, in a sort of similar way, it's sort of looking at the the uh, functionality of that as as well as the yeah you, you, you wouldn't I don't you wouldn't have any you wouldn't have any success in in registering this, uh, the the sort of the, the, the magnetism of it for example. I mean, they've been magnets have been around for forever um but in terms of how the class comes together um so how, how it functions that is certainly something that you could you could register as a design um how it looks once it's it is classed and when it's unclassed um if there was slightly different designs um just to try and cover off somebody from doing the same thing but just with, with a different design it, it's 
it's where it's where registered designs they they do have they they're good but they do have a limit um in, in an ideal world you would register you know 20 30 40 different designs that all have the same functionality just to try and stop as many people as possible from doing essentially the same thing but just in a, in a slightly different way um the, the, the key thing there again would be would, would be would, if, if it was new and novel which i, I think we probably struggle with would be again pattern to actually protect um the, 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 the whole the whole thing in terms of how the class actually works um but uh, but, but I mean, yeah magnets have been around far too long for anyone to get any kind of any kind of pattern protection on yeah. this yeah yeah brilliant i think i think in a lot of these cases you know if if it's to sort of seek legal advice and sort of like say is this is this a feasible thing to protect um yeah. and um we've got a, a couple more questions here one from antonia that has a board game and okay. the question question around is copyright enough or do they hmm. need to register it uh so board games um so board games in general are concepts so what you would need to be looking at is what's the title what's the name of the board game so that's something that would automatically have copyright in but you could also register that as a trademark for example um to, to try and give a sort of comparison if you took the game monopoly um i could create a game that you go around on a square that has four, you know, you, you buy and sell property, has a go to jail, um, has four railway stations and a pass go and it has two cards. Um, I just can't call it Monopoly because they, 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 they can't protect the idea and the concept of this game. I would need to express it in a different way. Um, now, if I, if I, if I started having all the same like London buildings and the same sort of colours and, and you really start making it look very, very similar in, in things that are expressive choices, then I would, I would be probably getting far too close to a copyright infringement again, but just the general concept itself, you can't protect. So yeah, in her, in her, in her case, she needs to look at the name of the, the title of the board game, see if it's worthwhile getting that trademarked. Um, if there are any ex uh, um, individual expressive features in there, then they'll, she'll have copyright protection in that alone. Um, she could look to, this would be limiting, um, but you could look to register the, the, the look of the board game as a registered design. Um, the only real issue with that is it still wouldn't stop somebody from bringing out essentially the, a, a, the same or a similar game, but just expressing it in a, in a different in a different way. So it's not, that's not as helpful in the circumstance. Um, but yeah, you're, you're really relying on what words are you using for copyright purposes and the title of the game, because that's the brand and that's that new trademark. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I have one or two questions myself. I'm just going to go to one final one from the Q&A. Um, if you are using a design from an 18th century garment, so um, we're talking okay. about historical costumes, um, can can you use that to create your own ideas? Uh, yeah, registered designs last 25 years. So mm -hmm. after uh, after 25 years, they are free game. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the sort of question I, I have is in relation, we're seeing more and more people collaborate with each other and, um, and it's sort of like how to protect your ideas. And I, I suppose um, if you've got um, uh, individuals collaborating with each other on, on um, a project or an individual working with a bigger brand or, you know, two brands working together, what is your overall advice um, about the steps people need to consider before embarking yeah. on that collaboration? Have an agreement in place is probably the number one important thing. Um, if you are intending on beginning a relationship where there's going to be a, a joint collaborative effort, in, 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 and in other words, the, the, the two or three of you, or how many of you there are, will have joint copyright in the work that is being produced, 
and have an agreement as to what 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 people are going to do what are they going to be responsible for and what is going to be their percentage share at the, at the end of it uh, there's too many we've had too many examples where people have jumped into well they not necessarily jumped into you just had someone who has been chipping in with ideas here and there or someone's been working on something someone's been chipping in ideas or oh you know maybe you should just change that or do this and do that and the next thing they say well hang on a second yeah, it wasn't all you. There was there was sort of me in, in this as well, and I think I should have some 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 sort of credit for it. So, the way you, the way that you avoid these those messy situations, which will either end in in, in a settlement agreement or, or or very expensive litigation. Co copyright litigation is very expensive, and just to give you some idea, that the last copyright infringement case that we had. Um, it, it was in the news actually. It was the uh, it was uh, it involved uh, the, 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 the granddaughter of the author of Dr. Shivago. Uh, her name was uh, Anna Pastanek. So she was in the High Court earlier this year. Um, her legal costs ran into the seven figures um, to bring a, to bring that that copyright claim, um, as did the defendants' legal costs as well. It was horrifically expensive. Um, so it's it's most most people just don't have access to that to that kind of money to, to even look at that route so the way that you avoid it all together is sit down and have that chat have that agreement get it in writing um if you've got you've got that agreement in place then, then everyone's signed and everyone's happy and everyone's done what they were supposed to do then you, you, you've got the contract you, 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 there's not there can't be any arguments and i say there can't be of course there can be some arguments um, but the point is that there, there's black and white rights in there to decipher much far more easily where the resolution is going to be. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm just uh, going to, I think that's a really, really good note to bring this session to a close. And I'm just going to release our poll and, and invite people um, to, to respond to the poll of how people have found the session. Um, but as as the sort of tips that I've sort of really taken away from that, Alex, is very much about communication, really good communication um, okay. so that, you know, if you if you are working with somebody else, working for somebody else, just even in relation to your own business, it's having that paperwork in place, yeah. photographing everything. It's it's all of that fantastic data that you can do yourself and and make recordings um and and definitely it's number one seeking legal advice if you don't know don't assume <laughs> it will, it's exactly most most ip problems occur because people have often tried to deal with it themselves um and just 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 fallen foul of of some obscure rule or some obscure point and they've just not quite understood it and that's not because they're not clever people it's just this is it's just not a very simple area of, of law to deal with um but that's why we're here we are here to help and we've got some screw loose in our head that tells us we enjoy this so you know do 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 come and chat with us about this this, this stuff fantastic that's absolutely brilliant and um I think you know there was there was so much more I'm sure that we we could have covered today. I think this has definitely <laughs> given us an overall picture about how to protect uh, your work and and hopefully Alex will bring you back in the future to sort of talk a little bit more about um, the co commercial side of, of yeah well, I'd love, yeah I'm happy to do that so we didn't quite get time to touch upon that but yeah talking about things like sort of NDAs and and, and terms and conditions which are particularly important but spoiler have terms and conditions they are incredibly important yeah yeah definitely okay so on that note that is a, an invitation that will bring you back and no um, in the meantime thank you for everyone joining us today we will share this webinar um to you all as well as putting it on our website and thank you so much alex for your insight it's truly valuable and really really appreciate your time thank you no, you're very welcome pleasure to have you cheers take care cheers cheers take care bye, everyone guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye.